David Stanley Hewitt uses Japanese techniques to create artwork that respects Japanese tradition. He's a Japan-based contemporary artist with international appeal. So far, he has held successful exhibitions in Japan, South Korea, Hong Kong, Singapore, and New York. Recently, his work has even been presented to official state guests as a gift from the Japanese government. This time on Japanology Plus, we meet an artist with a great love for Japanese tradition, history, and values. Hello and welcome to Japanology Plus, I'm Peter Barakan. Today we present another of our Japanophile profiles. I'm in a place called Karuizawa, which is a mountain resort a little outside Tokyo. I'm going to be meeting David Stanley Hewitt, an American artist who specializes in ceramics and abstract art. His work is becoming well known not just in Japan, but internationally as well. He's been living in Japan for nearly 30 years now, and we're going to be talking about what he finds so enthralling about this country. Hi Hello. Nice, nice to, to meet, meet you. you. Welcome. <laughs> Thank you for having us. You've chosen a good day to come up. <laughs> yeah, it is. It's, it's not as cold as I was <laughs> yeah. expecting, actually. It's a good sunny it's, day. It's, it's lovely. So this is the gallery. Wow, OK. Um, We've got some paintings oh. and some pottery and all sorts of knickknacks around. Is this all recent work? Uh, mostly recent work, yeah, for the paintings. Um, pottery is a little, you know, mix match. Uh -huh. Meet David Stanley Hewitt, a contemporary artist who specializes in ceramics and abstract painting. His work seems simple at first glance, but look closer and you'll find an American sensibility blended harmoniously with the artist's deep appreciation for Japan. Hewitt's signature material is gold. In particular, gold leaf. These thin strips of gold are a traditional Japanese art material. The gold leaf used here is 98% pure, so it's extremely resistant to degradation and discoloration. If you look closely, you'll see cracks in the surface. These cracks convey a sense of the passage of time. They create an impression of age. Gold is also a key material in Hewitt's ceramics. The clay is the type that is used to make shigaraki ware, one of Japan's leading styles of pottery. Hewitt mixes red with gold to make a new distinctive hue. The combination of red and gold is regarded as extremely challenging. It took Hewitt himself dozens of experiments to achieve this look. Thirty years after arriving in Japan, David Stanley Hewitt continues to explore Japanese values and tradition in his artwork. I understand that the themes for most of your pictures are related to Japan. Yeah, they, I, I think um, the, the series I've been working on for about 10 years is called Bushido series, so very related to Japan. Okay. Um, but also uh, other themes. Mm. Um, are a part of my work. Uh, the Bushido idea sort of came up. I had, I had uh, an experience of uh, being uh, in the Marine Corps, in the United States Marines for four years. Um, and then I also studied at Hokkaido University. Um, in university, I studied Japanese history and happened upon samurai, of course. Bushido, for people who don't know what it is, is literally the way of the samurai. That's right, yeah. The first time that Bushido was used as a word mm. was in the 20th century, I think. It was a guy called Nitobe. That's right. Who wrote yeah. a book in English. Yeah, so Nitobe-san was the first one to kind of put together the, the, the concept of mm. Bushido, which of course existed, but perhaps hadn't been named so uh -huh. aggressively or, you know. Uh -huh. um, 
Yeah, so the, the interest in Bushido came from my experience in the Marine Corps. Um, one of the reasons I joined oh. the Marine Corps was, was um, perhaps being a bit naive, <laughs> thinking things that my parents taught me were absolutely true, that people shouldn't lie, you know. Uh -huh. um, you should protect those that are weaker than you. Uh -huh. uh, honesty matters, you know, th things like that. <laughs> Uh, you say you were naive. You mean when you joined the Marines, you found out that it wasn't necessarily no, 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 the no, case? No, 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 no. That in the rest of the world, it's not necessarily oh. the case. <laughs> okay. But the okay. Marines stand for those things pretty strongly. Okay. Right? For okay. integrity and discipline and honesty and, and things that, that mattered to me. Okay. Um, so that was one of the reasons I joined the Marine Corps, but it was also one of the, the um, sort of points of departure to be interested in samurai. And Bushido, uh, okay. which is kind of the, okay. the code of ethics of samurai, right? Mm -hmm. Kind of looking at, at being being heroic, um, being charitable, uh, discipline, right? Loyalty, mm. all these things that that um, have have common points with the Marines mm. attracted me to finding out more about that. So mm. when I started this Bushido series over 10 years ago, mm. I wanted to see how simple I could yeah. make the paintings and still express what I was trying to say. And by simple, I mean I, I only used three colors for 10 years. Uh -huh. So I used black, red, and gold. Mm -hmm. Black, I, I identified as discipline. Red, uh. as in Japanese, jonetsu or, or passion. passion. Um, you know, sort of battle passion. Uh, and the gold is the elegance that I found so interesting about samurais. While being warriors, right, mm. they were also doing poetry and tea ceremony and wearing beautiful kimono and doing these things that are incredibly um, elegant. Mm -hmm. um, and I thought that mm -hmm. that contrast was quite impressive. For 10 years, Hewitt was representing the Japanese concept of Bushido with just three colors, red, black, and gold. These days, he also uses blue, which has added a new dimension to his art. This particular painting is celestial is thinking about stars and a starry night um, that I spent in the Marine Corps. Part oh. of our training and cold weather training was going for a week on your own on top of a very snowy mountain, and they just leave you there for a week wow. um, with very few <laughs> tools to survive. Do you have um, food? Or do yeah, you have to go and you have some food, hunt um, animals and not stuff? Much, not much housing material, so you end up digging a hole in the snow and sleeping in that, like a coffin. <laughs> Um, yeah, so it's challenging, but uh, more than the survival side of it, it was the loneliness of right, just being there for seven days with no other human contact. Right. And I remember looking at the stars. It was beautiful. There were beautiful nights, and I looked at the stars and thought, my family and you know the people I love are looking at the same stars right now. Uh huh. So it connected me back to them. So I was thinking about that when I painted this particular painting. Ah. Uh, yeah. Okay. This whole series, the Bushido series and the, the gold leaf and all that, that um, uh, those materials mm. um, are the result of me going to a museum in Tokyo and seeing 12th century Japanese screens, the traditional Japanese screens. 12th century, 12th okay. to 14th century, they were doing a show of those. And, oh. and a lot of them, you couldn't even tell what the painting was anymore because it was so worn away. Um, oh, okay. And I actually thought that was the beautiful part. Mm. I loved mm. that. So the gold leaf, this is where I fell in love with so gold leaf. So it looked abstract, although it, not, although it wasn't. It wasn't intended to be, but okay. it was abstract. Yeah, uh -huh. exactly, exactly. Huh. Yeah. So the, the gold leaf was worn away, and you could see the washi, the handmade paper, and the pigments, the black pigments coming through from underneath. Hmm. And I thought that was the most beautiful thing I'd ever seen. So I reacted to it differently, perhaps, than other people would, they would say, wow, there's, it's a really old painting. <laughs> and I looked at it as kind of abstract art, and I thought, so wow, that's... Retro avant-garde. That's, yeah, yeah. <laughs> kind of. yeah, so oh. that, that's fantastic. So immediately huh. had to go figure out the world of gold leaf and traditional Japanese painting. So I started studying traditional Japanese painting and techniques with a long-term goal of getting back to abstract hmm. uh, using those materials. Um, I'm using uh, cotton, really thick cotton canvases. Cotton? Yeah. Is that 
the usual thing for canvas? Yeah, well, for oil paintings, people use silk as well, but, mm. but um, cotton is very uh, tough and okay. thick, okay. and I use very thick, um, hard um, wood frames because Japan has so much humidity. Right. That if you use thinner ones, they'll bend over time. Okay. They'll warp a little bit. Mm. Um, so it's important to use a really strong canvas <laughs> mm. for what I'm doing. Mm. Um, and then just I use acrylic paint. This is acrylic paint? This is acrylic. Okay. On cotton canvas. So you just get a nice smooth layer like that and then take the gold that we've just applied. And I usually stand for this bit. Mm -hmm. Line it up. You apply like that, and then you have to, the, the brush actually leaves some texture in the paint. Mm. So I remove that with my finger, mm -hmm. like this, and then the cracking method, which I use, is just like this. You just pull, like this, and I'm going to create vertical lines in this one, uh, and just remove a little. Just applying a little pull, pressure there. And pull, uh -huh. and pull. And you can actually control it a lot more than you would think. Hmm. Like that. And then that comes off, that gets discarded. Mm -hmm. And that's one layer, one sheet, like that. Okay. Which gets done thousands and thousands of times <laughs> over and over. And then when, that, when that's all dry, I'll take a um, big heavy brush like this um, and really scrape hard at it. And to create more cracks, and well, just even even though it's put on the paint on this wet paint, oh. um, there are areas where the gold won't attach to the paint, oh, which is okay. actually great because when you brush it, it gives kind of a, a uh, older, worn feeling to it, like an old Japanese screen. Ah, yeah. okay, okay, yeah. I imagine this gold leaf must be quite expensive to use. It is, yeah. You don't want to sneeze too often. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. But it's, it's really interesting to work with different levels of the gold leaf. So you can go there. Um, if you move down the price spectrum, um, gold will be mixed with copper and other metals um, uh, to make it cheaper. Uh, okay. Does but it look a lot different when they do that? It looks a lot different. Okay. To, to me. To, okay. Not to, to everyone, the no, not to, to everyone, but to me, mm. it definitely looks different. Uh. It feels different. Mm. Um, but the big thing is uh, sunlight over time. Mm. If you're using one that has a lot of copper or other metals in it, it'll change color over time. Uh. Right? You know how copper turns sort of greenish, greenish. over time? Yeah. 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 So um, using pure gold um, means that you could hang this in, right in front of a window in your house and the sunlight could hit it. It won't change color. Uh. Yeah. All right. And it also feels better. <laughs> mm -hmm. Knowing it's pure. Mm -hmm. yeah. Obviously, you have these techniques together now for um, cracking it and making it yeah. look any way you want. Did it take a long while to be able to do that? I think what took the most was getting used to using gold leaf mm. um, and just playing around with different techniques. So I also do traditional Japanese screens and traditional Japanese painting. Um, I've heard that not a lot of materials. people do that these days. It's it's, it's incredibly labor intensive, so people mm. tend to not want to spend the preparation time. And are the tools different as well for the two different styles? The tools are different. The gold leaf is the only sort of similar material, okay. Okay. and the technique is similar. Uh -huh. um, but the materials, obviously acrylic um, dries much quicker, right. uh, easier to use, easier to clean up. Mm. Um, prep time is five minutes versus maybe two hours. <laughs> okay. Right, so yeah. you use these uh, natural Unwashed. pigments for oh for washi. Yeah, that's for, for the screens. traditional Japanese paintings. Yeah. Oh, I nice. actually went and learned because um, I have kind of a foreigner complex in Japan, right? I want to be a hundred percent about everything that I'm engaging in in terms of Japanese culture. Mm -hmm. So I went to actually learn how to make the screens as well. Usually in Japan, the the screen painter and the shokunin or craftsman who are making the screens are two different things. Right. Um, but I wanted to learn from zero mm. all the way up. So mm. I went and learned how to actually make the screen. So I've made this one that's on the table here. And so I went mm. through that process. It was incredibly labor intensive as well. So. Oh, 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 oh. <laughs> Hewitt was born in 1967 in Ohio, USA. His mother, a painter, was acquainted with artists of many different disciplines and from a young age he began painting and making pottery. 
His interest in Japan began at the age of 14, when he started learning karate. Later, he studied Japanese history at the university. Why did you decide to do Japanese history? Well, I've been doing karate um, since I was about 14 years old. Okay. Um, and doing pottery since I was about four years old. So if you're with my mother, who's an artist, um, uh -huh. so if you're in the pottery world in any way, Asia becomes a, a focal point. Uh, Japan, Korea, China, in terms of okay. um, you know long pottery traditions and very elegant uh, pottery. And were um, you aware of those traditions from fairly early on? Pretty early on, yeah. Mm. I think I think my first um, uh, real exposure to Japanese pottery was uh, attending a, an exhibition when I was in university at the University of Massachusetts, and I went to that and and was just blown away by the elegance and the, you know, beauty and the attention to detail and, mm. you know, the pottery I had been making until that time was much more utilitarian. Okay. You know, cookie jars and bowls and uh -huh. mugs and things like that. Um, mm. And I just thought the, the elegance and the attention to detail and just, you know, the, the powerful glazes um, mm. that he was using just, mm. just blew me away. And from that point, I knew I had to go to Japan and, and study pottery. In order to study Japanese ceramics, obviously you need to be here. Yeah. How did you go about that? Well, I had a friend who had been um, studying pottery in Japan, mm -hmm. and she had lots of potter friends, uh -huh. um, and she introduced me to a bunch of people, and I ended up working with one of those people and um, was shocked on the first day when I discovered that the wheel turns in the opposite direction in Japan. I didn't I, know that. Than I had been doing for, <laughs> for about 20 years. So you know. wait a minute, it goes clockwise, anti-clockwise, and which, which? So clockwise in Japan and counterclockwise in the US. So, oh, wow. so I had spent years and years going Isn't like this, that interesting? and all of a sudden I sat down at the wheel and they're like, okay, show us what you can do. And the wheel went the other way. <laughs> <laughs> I wonder why that is. Isn't that Well, I mean, we drive on the other side of the road too, so I, I don't know. <laughs> But that was, a, that was a pretty big shock, originally. <laughs> okay. In 1988, Hewitt moved to Japan and embarked upon a new life as an artist. At first, his paintings were on the theme of family. He has always tried to incorporate traditional Japanese techniques. When I was first here, I was living in Tokyo. I was uh -huh. living in a place called Mitaka. Okay. Out in Western Tokyo, uh -huh. um, and I had I was painting in my six mat apartment. Okay, I, um, I used to live in one of those when yeah. I first came here. <laughs> um, I decided I wanted to. I got a, a body of work ready, and I wanted to have a show. You know, mm. and naively I went to galleries and thought they would say, "Sure, come on in." <laughs> Turns out it's not that easy. Um, so I ended up going to about f I think forty galleries overall over wow. the course of several months. Oh. Um, and showing them, at the time, we didn't have digital anything, um, so slides. So you would make oh, several sets of slides, okay. leave it with them for a week or so. Huh. They would review and come back to you, and 39 said no and one said yes. So it took quite a long time okay. to get there. And at the time, this is a long time ago, I understand they, you know, they, they see a foreigner coming in. He's probably going to leave and go back to his country in two or three years anyway. So mm. we don't want to invest the time and mm. all that sort of stuff. But one gallery took a chance on me. Oh. Um, and we had a fantastic, I was painting all on washi, mm. handmade paper at mm. the time. Um, we put up 19 paintings and sold 17 in the first show. Yeah, okay. and mind you, they were, they were priced very reasonably. But, okay, but, even but, so. But it was yeah. a fantastic yeah. start. Um, now, the way I understand it is that art galleries in Japan, the painter has to rent the space. Uh, there are two ways to okay. do it. Um, there are rental galleries mm. uh, all over Japan. Mm -hmm. um, Ginza has a lot of them. Right. Um, and then there are sponsored shows. Okay. Yeah. So I've never actually rented a gallery. I've been sponsored the entire so time. So the gallery owner, in some cases, will actually like, in, take a chance. Yeah. Is what on, you said. on established yeah. artists, it's almost 100% that. Okay. Yeah. Okay. So mostly rentals are, you know, you'll have groups of students that rent a gallery or mm -hmm. people who are doing it as a hobby or something like that. Mm -hmm. um, I think once you're an established artist, it's always sponsored. Okay. Yeah. Okay. And then they, they just take a cut of what's sold. All right. Yeah. Uh-huh. Yeah. And once you'd had that 
opening show, yeah. that your, your first show, did it go pretty smoothly after that? Yeah, it did. It, well, I got a, another massive bit of luck. You know, in any career like this, you need a, a healthy dose of luck. Mm -hmm. um, the Imperial Hotel in Tokyo mm -hmm. was doing a massive renovation. This is the Frank Lloyd Wright yeah. building. Yeah. Um, they were doing a massive renovation of 108 of their rooms. And they were having a competition to see who would be the artist that would do the art for those rooms. They were going to have one artist one doing artist do all of the all paintings of for 108 rooms. Yeah. Wow. So the interior designer for the Imperial Hotel came to that exhibition, liked my work, huh. and said, would you like to submit a painting for the competition? Huh. And I said, of course I would. <laughs> so, right? huh. so I submitted a large uh, washi painting, a, a hand, you know, handmade paper painting. Um, and I won that competition. Hmm. Um, so I got an order for 108 paintings <laughs> all of a sudden <laughs> after my first show. So it was a huge bit of luck. Right. Um, and the Imperial Hotel is incredibly famous in Japan. Everyone knows it. Right. Uh, it's, you know, from architect architecture standpoint, it's very famous overseas as well. Hmm. Um, and so that kind of helped me launch into this career that I've now been doing for hmm. 26 years. Hmm. Hewitt's art is prominently displayed in several hotels. In lobbies and guest rooms alike, his work makes a unique visual impact. He has also been a part of around 50 exhibitions in Japan and elsewhere, and his work frequently sells out. Today, Hewitt is visiting a gallery in a major department store in preparation for an upcoming solo exhibition. In 2008, the store stocked obi sashes and cotton kimono designed by Hewitt. They outsold all similar items. His designs have an underlying Japanese sensibility. And I think that's what resonates with our customers. Hewitt is different from Japanese artists in that his work takes so many forms. And that's what prompted us to collaborate with him on new products. Hewitt continues to expand his scope of activities. In 2018, he worked with a major Austrian glassmaker, and the resulting designs proved to be a huge success. He has also created a new line of clothing. Hewitt handles the design while Japanese artisans take care of actually making each item. For example, these silver buttons were made in Niigata. And this embroidery was done in Gumma. Hewitt continues to work on collaborative projects with a network of artisans from multiple fields. Ten years ago, after moving to Karuizawa, he set up a studio and gallery. His work can be seen around the neighborhood at local restaurants and tourist spots. Since Hewitt moved to Karuizawa, it has become an important part of his identity as an artist. He took us to one of his favorite places in the town that he has come to call home. Look at the gradations in here. Yeah. That's beautiful. It really is. That's why I like it when it's just starting, right? When you get the greens and reds mm. together. I think it's absolutely gorgeous. Do you get ideas for painting as well out of uh, these kinds sure, of things? Sure. Yeah. Of course, yeah. yeah. You can't, can't help it. Right, <laughs> right. What made you decide to live here in Karoiza? Well, we were, I, I got married in Tokyo. Um, and I grew up on a farm. Mm. Uh, for a large part of my childhood on a farm in upstate New York, which is very similar to the Karadiza area in okay. terms of altitude and weather and um, just the general feel. Mm. Um, and then on the, the work side, it was a, a place where I felt I could kind of slow down a little bit. 
Mm -hmm. Tokyo is very fast paced and high energy and lots of good pressure. Um, and uh, I thought in Karizawa, I could probably pursue my art in, with a, a little deeper breath, you know, before starting. Um, so it's turned out to be, I've been here almost 10 years now and it's been wonderful. Mm. Yeah. How do you see your art developing as you go on in your life? Um, art, pottery, um, all of it, I think, is over the past few years, and it'll probably continue, is getting more simple, actually. Hmm. Um, so I've, I've, not really thinking about it, but just by, by natural progression, um, I've tended to focus more on uh, simplicity, hmm. using fewer colors, using fewer tools, and trying to get better at a smaller amount of things. Hmm. Rather mm. than rather than you know trying trying to be good at everything. Mm -hmm. right. yeah. On these Japanophile programs, the last question is always the same one. It's right. like, what is Japan to you? <laughs> Very broad question. I know. Uh, I, know. I think. Um, let me answer it in a very broad way. Then, I think uh, Japan to me is an agreement. Um, it's an agreement between the people who live here, consciously or unconsciously, about how we're going to live together um, mm. in terms of politeness, um, in terms of obeying rules, you know, all the things we love about Japan, um, <laughs> the, the things that, the things that um, everyone communally decides is the way we're going to live together mm. are the things that I find attractive about Japan. So mm. that's a long way of saying it's an agreement. <laughs> Okay, yeah. okay. I, I laughed when you said about the rules because yeah. um, in England, at any rate, we, we, we tend to think of rules as things that should be, at the very least, bent, if right. not broken, right. <laughs> which yeah. is not the approach here. Yeah. So that was a kind of invo involuntary reaction right. to that, but I kind of get where you're going. With yeah. That. yeah, that's kind of the thing that makes Japan great, is that, that you, you can depend on people behaving in, in a certain way. Mm -hmm. um, not restrictively, but in a, in a sort of cooperative way. Uh -huh. Yeah. Uh -huh. Okay, thank you very much. Yeah, thanks, it's been a real pleasure. I really thank enjoyed it too. Thank you. Next time, coffee. In the country that invented canned coffee, Japan's love affair with this drink continues to evolve in many different ways.